Okay, going to do another whiteboard session. Um, the uh, the last one seemed to go quite well, so we'll see how this one goes. Um, this is a topic that I've um, spoken about quite a few times at events and uh, so on in the last year, and it's uh, about the topic of um, a management theory, I guess, uh, which was created by a guy called Michael Porter back in the late 70s. Um, Porter's a management theorist, he uh, is at Harvard Business School, and he was in the late 70s, and uh, he developed a model to be able to s describe the competitive pressures that uh, companies find and how they can therefore analyse them and deal with them. Um, and it's something that I think is becoming increasingly relevant to IT departments in particular, and the IT industry more generally, as a result of um, the increasing competition that consumerization and cloud are uh, making uh, IT departments face. Now the model has, as the name suggests, five dimensions. And what I'll do is I'll talk through it using the example of something outside of the model of IT, and then we'll just talk a bit about what it might mean for the average CIO these days. So what Porter said was that there were five dimensions of competition and the first of those is the dimension of competitors. So uh, the example I'm going to talk through is the one of a UK retailer called Marks and & Spencers and Marks & Spencers are a, a firm that traditionally have been the place where people go to buy underwear and um, uh, other clothing items and I guess in recent years as well food has been a big part of their proposition. It's a sort of department store but it's um, mostly their own branded goods. Now um, traditionally Marks and Spence has had uh, a series of quite direct competitors in terms of companies that had a very similar sort of proposition and as a kid in the uh, 70s and 80s um, Marks and Spencers were one of I guess three retail chains uh, the other two being Littlewoods and British Home Stores. They had a similar sort of presence on the market. I guess that Marks and Spencers have probably been as seen as the, the most prestige of the three. So Marks and Spencers are obviously very keen on understanding who its competition are, and that would have been their traditional retail competition. Now, competitive pressure also comes from your clients or customers. And clients or customers are generally looking for things to be cheaper and of uh, better quality or more volume. And that's a, a typical kind of pressure that uh, clients or customers will, will put a service or product organisation under. It's not always the way those we'll see in a minute. And then you also have pressure from uh, suppliers and uh, in the supply chain for a retailer, that's the people who are manufacturing the products uh, that eventually go onto the shop floor to be sold. Now, in the up until the 90s, Marks & Spencers used an awful lot of suppliers still in, my, in, fact, in many ways almost exclusively from uh, the UK. And clients were starting to get increasing pressure, customers were starting to put increasing pressure on the company to be able to uh, get um, cheaper price for the same quality goods. And that meant for Marks & Spencers they were coming under a lot of pressure from other retailers who started to switch their manufacturing to the Far East, India and so on, where you could obviously, with much lower labour costs, produce goods at a much lower cost than doing it at a higher wage economy like the UK. That was one of the things that uh, in the late 90s I think really uh, Marks & Spencers came under an awful lot of pressure about. Now, in addition to uh, the, the competition to clients and suppliers, there are two other sources of competition that um, uh, Porter uh, described. The first is what he called new entrants. And new entrants would be people who did a similar job but emerged onto the market. Now, in terms of Marks & Spencers, who were effectively a clothing retailer, there were a whole series of new clothing retailers that emerged in the 80s and 90s. And whether those were homegrown UK-based companies, for example, like Next, uh, or overseas companies coming in, um, the, the Spanish chains, the uh, people like uh, H&M, um, uh, The Gap from the US, um, directly competing with Marks & Spencers in terms of selling general clothing 
often with quite different propositions though and uh, one of the things that was really key when retailers like Next came along was that they made shopping a much more pleasant environment than maybe Marks and Spencers had done in the 70s and 80s where the shop floor was more uh, little more than an extension of the warehouse behind the store and then you had people who were much more interested in re uh, in um, merchandising within a retailer to be able to make things look good so it was more likely that people wanted to be there and also to buy the products. And then finally uh, you have according to the um, Porter model uh, substitution and that is where people find an alternative way to do what it was that they used to do with you, your product or service. Now for Marks and Spencers and for Littlewoods and for BHS the thing that came there was that people rather than going to a clothes retailer to buy clothes they started going to supermarkets and as the big supermarkets emerged in the 90s the Tesco's, the Sainsbury's um, people were starting to be able to buy clothing in a completely different retail environment. Now, Porter's Five Forces is the sort of thing that CIOs for many years would have looked at and said that's very interesting, that gives me a way to be able to describe my business, uh, but it's not very much practical use to me as a, um, as a CIO because effectively I have a service that is supplied in monopoly. That if somebody wants some IT, they come to the IT department and they can't go anywhere else for it. There would have been pressure, obviously, over uh, what clients in the organisation wanted, and there's definitely always been pressure around what suppliers have wanted to supply. But in the old world, the idea of competitors, new entrants and substitution in particular was just um, uh, completely out of the scope of what a, a head of IT would have needed to worry about. However, then we started to provide the internet to people's desktops, and all of a sudden... IT has entered into, corporate IT has entered into a truly competitive environment. If you think about what we are facing today, um, and think of it in terms of Porter's Five Forces, uh, you can see that almost all of them now apply to the average in-house IT shop. Um, clients within an organisation have much higher expectation, driven by the fact that the computing experience they have outside of work now often is much better than the computing experience they have in the office and that's partly driven by uh, pretty much a ubiquitous broadband across um, developed economies now uh, it's driven by uh, faster refresh cycles of um, computers uh, in the home quite often so running much more uh, recent versions of operating systems at the home than they do in the office. Uh, much less constraint over what you can do compared with a lockdown corporate desktop. And then also the emergence of new platforms like slides, like smartphones, that means that people have new ways of being able to access computing services that are very different from the traditional model of a computer sitting on a desk. So clients' expectations have gone uh, through the roof and then suppliers obviously continue to put pressure onto IT departments to buy more product, to uh, spend more money on, on product. There's however on the right hand side been a lot of change in terms of both uh, new entrants and also substitution. If we look at substitution first, it's now quite possible for people to be able to use services that are commodity over the internet services uh, to be able to do real work. It's by frequently referred to as doing business by Facebook. Rather than sending an email to somebody using the corporate email system, if it's quicker and easier and more convenient, people will use Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever else to be able to do that communication. And you can see in all directions now with cloud services that are often provided for free, people are able to do things that traditionally the IT department would have delivered. Up the top, new entrants, you've got a constant evolving set of services that are coming in that are providing um, new services into the IT world, although the IT department in of itself doesn't have new entrants to market in the way that, say, Marks & Spencer's did in the retail world. Um, but competition is coming now for real, where people are often being marketed to within businesses directly, uh, rather than going through their IT department. And if you look at the emergence of Salesforce in the last um, five years, one of the key things with Salesforce was that they directly marketed to the people in the business that was likely to use their product rather than marketing to the IT department to try to get them to procure the service on their business's behalf. 
No real answers out of this. It's just that actually IT people need to think about where competition is coming from now. And that the really big takeaway for this is that IT now exists in a very competitive environment and that the services that are provided by an IT department need to be able to try to compete with that that's on offer to the people in their organisations who can do an awful lot, uh, often now using services and devices that are not even provided uh, by the IT department within the organisation.